and we should suspect it if we see a line here go from the posterior extending anterior. The CT is very diagnostic. And we have the fracture dislocation. It is failure of the three columns, compression, tension, rotation, or shear, or any combination of these forces will result in fracture dislocation. The anterior hinge is disrupted, the posterior ligamentous comp uh, complex is disrupted, there is dislocation, and definitely neurological complication. Here is the x-rays, the CT, showing the dislocation of L1 over L2. And this is where you can see a double body in one section because of the cut goes through the dislocated vertebra and the vertebra below in one level. It is crossing here in this area. So you can see double bodies in one section. The surgical application of the TLICS system, the morphology, peak compression, versus translation, rotation, and distraction, the uh, radiographs, and CT. We do an MRI if we need to know what is wrong with the soft tissues as well as the cord. We have to examine neurologically and predict the uh, line of treatment for these cases. How to approach a spine trauma? This is very important. There is a pre-hospital care at the scene of the uh, accident. We have to be careful in extracting the patient from the uh, vehicle and immobilize the cervical spine by color, the spine on um, hardboard by rolling the patient, not by lifting the patient from the legs and the arms. And we should tape the patient to the hardboard to uh, avoid any uh, unnecessary movement. We should maintain an airway especially if there is a cervical injury, and he should be rapidly and safely transferred uh, to a specialized hospital for spinal injuries. The ABC, airway, blood pressure, and hemodynamic stability of the patient is recommended. Then we do a secondary survey Remove all the, spine, the spinal board where the patient was mobilized. Remove cervical color uh, carefully and then stray the patient from top to bottom. We should remove the clothes, we inspect the chest for bruises, fracture ribs, paradoxical movement of the chest, any bleeding, any abrasions, lacerations. Uh, if there is limb asymmetry, we should suspect fractures, chest expansion, and paradoxical breathing. Then, by palpation, we look for tender area, especially in the midline, from the base of the skull down to the sacrum. If there is a malalignment from the back, then we should suspect dislocation or fracture spinous process. Or, if we feel a step at the back, then there is a dislocation or fracture uh, posterior spinous process as well. We do the neurological examination, sensory and motor, and we should be able to localize if there is a lesion by the dermatomal and uh, root affection. We should know what muscles are supplied by L1 or L2 or L3 or 4 and L5 and S1. The sensation, we, this diagram should be available in the emergency room so that we can apply it to the patient 
when we examine the patient. The reflexes, papineski sign, when it is positive, there is a disconnection between the top and bottom of the cord. Perianal uh, and palbocarbinosis reflexes, the reflexes, rectal tone should be tested. Then x-rays, plain x-ray will let you know if there is a major uh, pathology or not, the shape of the bodies, uh, height of the bodies, the transverse process in the AP, the distance between the pedicle and the AP view, uh, the uh, spinous process in the lateral view, uh, if there is encroachment in the canal or not. We measure the amount of body compression by comparing the height from the back compared to the mid and the anterior part of the body. If we cannot, then we use the body above as a reference. The distance between the front and the back, if it is not symmetrical with the above and below vertebrae, then there is a high comminution and compression. The cup angle is measured Recording stopped. to measure the amount of angulation in the anterior, in the lateral view. As I said, the interpedicular distance is very important. The uh, symmetry and the shape of the bodies, the position of the spinous process, the contour of the bodies. All these should be uh, looked at. The distance between the spinous process is very important. It means that the posterior soft tissue uh, connect, uh, ligaments are interrupted as well. The CT, it's, the, it's more accurate than the plain X-ray. It gives you the uh, amount of compression. It gives you the encroachment on the canal, whether the pedicles are involved or not so that you can put a screw in the affected body or not. The MRI, as I said, for the soft tissues, mainly the cord and the amount of uh, canal compression and the status of the cord, whether it is discontinued or not, compressed or not, or there is change in the signal. Regarding the treatment, the treatment option is either you have to fix and decompress. These are the main two rules uh, in treating the fractured spine. But how do, to do it? Would you go through the front or would you go through the back? This was the basis of our study. Uh, we had 20 cases. Uh, treated posteriorly and 20 cases treated anteriorly, randomized. One case anterior, one case posterior until we finish the 40 cases. The goals were to stabilize the spine, decompress the spine and realign it. And aiming at fusion and the permanent stabilization. If there is a cord injury, then uh, corticosteroids may or may not have a role. There is a controversy regarding the mega shot of soluble uh, corticosteroid, 30 milligram per kV as one bolus. Uh, then you continue by infusion protein pump inhibitors to minimize the stress ulcers in these patients. Uh, I believe in it. You may not believe in it. Literature, uh, there is a controversy. So you will lose nothing by giving the patient the methylprednisolone. The non-operative treatment, if the compression is mild, less than uh, 20% or 30% of the height, then you can conserve bed rest, braces, and then early mobilization as soon as the pain is tolerable.
using the brace, thoracolumbar brace, as we can see here. Then we come to the operative treatment. If there is loss than, uh, of a height more than 50%, there is canal compromise, there is a neurology. The aim of the surgery is, as I said, decompress the canal, stabilize the spine, and end up with a solid fusion. The surgical options, totally posterior, whether minimal invasive or open surgery. Minimal invasive, if you don't have to open the canal or decompress the canal, then you put percutaneous screws uh, through the back and stabilize the spine. Or anterior, where you have to decompress the canal, remove the broken vertebra, put a mesh, and stabilize through an anterior uh, device. As I said, there is controversies regarding uh, whether to go posterior or anterior, and this was actually the aim of the thesis. Is the anterior approach is more superior to the posterior approach or not? And we will see. Those who completed the study were 15 patients, went, have had an anterior surgery and decompression and fixation, and 15 per patients completed the uh, study to, and they had posterior uh, decompression stabilization and grafting as well. The follow-up uh, lasts for about 12 months for each patient, and the results we will see. Regarding the back pain, one year post-op, according to Dennis Scale, group A, which is the anterior one, no pain or mild pain. However, 20% of group B presented with moderate pain. So anterior surgery is better regarding pain. Regarding movement of the spine, group A presented with excellent uh, 26%, good uh, 40%, fair 26 excluded, fair was excluded due to paraplegia, uh, 6%. But group B presented with excellent 20, which is less than group A, the anterior, good 33 compared with 40, fair 33, compared more than the uh, group A, we excluded paraplegics 13%. Regarding the neurological status improvement, group A, 66% presented with neurological improvement at least one grade on Frankel scale, with the same degree of neurological insert, and 26 were already completely free at the time of trauma and also passed up. So there was no neurological complication after surgery. Group B, the one treated posteriorly, 20% presented with neurological improvement at least one grade. So neurological improvement in anterior surgery is better. Regarding deformity correction and maintaining the correction, group A was better. The mean value of COPS angle of kyphosis pre-op was 23.8 degrees, ranging from 10 to 42, while post-operatively it was 8.7 ranging from 3 to 18, and at least follow-up was 10.7, ranging from 3 to 20 by, uh, by the end of the first year. For group B, which treated posteriorly, the mean value of copped angle kyphosis was 15, ranging from 2 to 22. Post-operatively, it was 8, ranging from 0 to 20. 
and the last follow up was 15 degree which is higher so we lose correction by doing the posterior alone this results in a mean gain in reduction of 15.1 degree and a mean loss at follow up of 2 degrees for group A and a mean reduction 7.1 degrees and the mean loss of follow up 6.7 which is higher than the group A I'm going to present a few cases. Uh, first case, male patient, 52 years old, had a direct trauma uh, by heavy object fell on his back. Radiological examination, pre-op plan X-ray, 30 degree kyphotic angle, CT3D. And there is some encroachment on the canal here. Posterior midline incision, application of four ped pedicle screws to T10, 11, and four pedicle screws at L12. The complication, no intra-op complication, good post-op, mobilization second day post-op. And this is the correction after surgery. It is 20 degree, so it was reduced uh, about 10 degrees only. And my belief is that this correction is gained above and below the fracture. The height of the affected vertebra hasn't changed, it, which added a lot of stresses to the uh, construct posteriorly. And we can see that we lost some correction. We came back to 27 degrees. Case two, a male patient, 40 years of age, involved in a road traffic accident. Radiological assessment, the X-ray and cop angle, 17. Though the CT may look like greater than 17 degree height, loss is more than 50 percent. This patient was treated with a pedicle screws through the back. Patient good post-op. Mobilization second day. Still post-op correction 17 degrees. We didn't gain any correction. No gain in the height, and we lost more from 17 to 27 degrees because of the uh, loads, tremendous loads applied to the top and bottom screws. Case three, 17 year old boy fell from a height the pre-op x-ray and the angle was 42 uh, encroachment in the canal almost total obliteration here in this cut uh, this patient was dealt with anteriorly through the left rocco abdominal retroperitoneal approach and resection of the body was done, decompression, distraction, and a uh, cage was applied, and fixation with an anterior device. Either two screws, one above and one below, with the pyra mesh, or uh, an atlas device, or canida device. Mobilization, the second day passed up because the patient neurology was okay. Here we can see we reduced the 40 plus angulation down to 5 degrees only because we restored the anterior column. And one screw above and one screw below with the pyra mesh provide the stability required. Add to, the, to this the, the harness or the brace. The patient start mobilization. 
If, uh, cost wise, this is less costly than the uh, construct posterior. Here, only two screws on pyro mesh, while the back you use at least four screws and two rods. Sometimes you need to do eight screws and uh, two rods. And this is the CT after surgery. Total restoration of the height and a good stabilization. And this is one year after still maintaining the five uh, degree correction or residual typhosis. And this is the patient praying after one year of her surgery, still movement of the spine. Case number four, 50 year old uh, RTA. He has got hip pain and back pain with limitation of movement, both lower limbs, hypesthesia, some neurological affection. The X-ray shows 30 degree uh, typhotic angle and the CT shows the comminution here and here to the body. And this is a 3D reconstruction CD, CT. Management through left rocco abdominal approach. Uh, Corpectomy was done. A paramesh was applied. None, no intra-op complication, good post-op neurology. Uh, we start mobilizing the patient the second day and exercising on the fifth post-op day. The correction uh, down to 18 degrees in the lateral view, as you can see here, and in the AP, uh, good alignment. Really, to read, which is very good compared with the posterior instrumentation. And here is the patient can bend and touch his toes and excellent back movements. To conclude, this study was made to compare the results of the anterior versus posterior stabilization, decompression of the spine in pressure spine, and the take home message. We found out that the anterior is superior uh, to the uh, posterior construct alone because it is a load sharing and not load bearing. The load bearing devices in the back is not good to regain height of the collapsed vertebra or maintain the correction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Talat Al Hadidi, Cairo University, Egypt, for this very interesting talk. Thank you so much, sir. You are welcome. If we have any questions to Professor Talat. Yes, sir. Uh, can I uh, pass a question? Thank you, Dr. Professor Talat. Yes. Uh, what's your opinion about uh, all from posterior? You can put a large cage through the, anterior, uh, through the posterior approach unless you sacrifice one of the roots. This is the problem with the ore from the posterior. Okay, but um, the in the dorsal the spine, I I do agree. Okay. You sacrifice one of the dorsal roots, and then you can insert the proper height of the uh, pyro mesh or the anterior device, and you apply compression from the back so you stabilize it. But through the thoracolumbar lumbar or lumbar area, where every root is very precious, then I would go anterior. The post-op pain of the anterior surgery is far less than the post-op pain from the back. The muscle back or the muscles of the back are kept non-touched. There is no denervation while in the uh, posterior one there is denervation of the muscles, the complication of any back surgery, open back surgery. 
What about the junk and like uh, diaphragmatic, diaphragmatic, diaphragm, uh, Quran and all this? Do you have any uh, complication from this one? No, I didn't get any. You cut the diaphragm about one centimeter from the rib cage. And then you re suture it, the cross, you moved it to the other side, you remove the body, you uh, cauterize the lumbar vessels or thoracic vessels in front of the body, and everything is under vision. The decompression is under vision, and this is the beauty of it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Professor Talat. Thank you so much, sir. You are welcome. Uh, congratulations for the you being the dean of the faculty. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Wishing you all the best, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I'll uh, stop sharing. Will be Professor uh, Mohammed Maziad from uh, in Shams University, uh, Egypt. Professor Maziad. Professor Maziad will speak about degenerative scoliosis. Yes. It's shared, sir. Professor Maziad, you are muted, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. You it's hear shared. me? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Good evening. Thank you for the previous speakers and my friend Dr. Talat for this nice lecture. Now I'm going to speak about different topic, which is the degenerative scoliosis. All the talks about the scoliosis as the adolescent age or the congenital type differ completely from what we are going to speak and address tonight, which is the degenerative scoliosis, which are uh, common now in our hands as spine surgeon. And we meet degenerative scoliosis at elder years quite frequently. The slide not moving. Eh? Uh, this, this is uh, just the uh, second slide. This was presented before in India and the different 
international meeting. And the objective of this talk is to increase the spine surgeon's awareness about the problem and to discuss the changes in the morphology and the biomechanics of the spine associated with degeneration and the deformity. So we're going to speak also about the clinical presentation, the different treatment options, and case presentation. This example of the cases we see at Elder Age Group, where you can find that the patient have been treated was uh, all surgery, fusion, limited fusion between uh, vertebral 2 and 3, and the complication below and above by adjacent uh, segment degeneration and disc changes and the scoliotic uh, deformity of the spine. This have to have the doing. The pathology and the muscle mechanics. The aim, the main cause is asymmetric deterioration of the facet joint. If we have a case which have not been treated by a recent scoliosis before, so that the we can find the pathology started by facet joint degeneration and disc space affection with degeneration of the disc itself. Dehydration of the disc, loss of disc height, then facet joint uh, erosion, destruction, and this asymmetry of the erosion on both sides makes the uh, twist or the uh, shift of the spine to the opposite direction. So asymmetrical deterioration with a spine shift and hypertrophy of the ligament and ossification sometimes of the ligament, this will end up with narrowing of the spinal canal and root canal. The narrowing of the spinal canal and root canal will give symptoms of chronication and the nerve entrapment syndrome or radiculitis in association of the deformity which is scoliosis. So this degenerative scoliosis is a painful scoliosis, not like the other type of scoliosis, which is painless scoliosis. Then secondary changes occur in the curves above the and lose a degenerative curve. May be difficult to develop in cases with previous fixation as a recent delivery. If the patient have previous surgery, hyphosis, or scoliosis, which was corrected and the spine is fused, so when he developed degenerative scoliosis in the lumbar spine, he find the difficulty to compensate because the elasticity of the spine is lost, the disc space is not elastic, so there is a problem in this condition. He may remain shifted, not compensated. With loss of normal lordosis, vertebral displacement takes place in the frontal and the sagittal plane. So degenerative spondylar diseases will take place with vertebral displacement, lateral lysis and the erythro lysis. And mm -hmm. this can end up with loss of balance in the frontal and the sagittal plane. This example of a case which have been treated by uh, Harrington Road to correct the scoliosis at the adolescent age and developed in the lower part of the spine degenerative exchanges with the scoliosis of the lumbar spine. This was complicated by the broken load in the upper part of the what the other symptoms? You will find diffuse back pain over the curve, pain at the bottom of the loading disc, loaded disc. Clothes become improbably fitting. Patient becomes short, shorter by time as the curve progresses. The rib case seems to be fitting closer to the middle. Uh, gradually occurring back pain. Pain started with the once the patient have degeneration and the deformity uncorrect, gradually occurring and the progressing pain at the lower back, pain increase with activity. It is worsening gradually by time. Pain tend to be more worse at the morning. Sitting feel better than standing and walking. And this is why, because the facets are less loaded in the sitting, while facet loading increase in standing and walking. Uh, uh, with this back pain, you have radicular pain, 
because the root is intrabed and radicular vein in association with, with back pain. Motor weakness, muscular uh, stiffness, and the curve of the will increase by one to two degree every year. The compensatory mechanism of this lumbar degenerative scoliotic curve is the affection of the uh, lower spine with loss of doses. The knee will be flexed, the hip will be extended, and the kyphosis of the dorsal spine will be decreased. The investigation, if the patient to come to you, have to do plain X-ray. The whole spine X-ray film is important in the coronal and sagittal plane. Two stress X-ray films for the whole spine is important. The MRI study for soft tissue and the spinal cord, CT and the CT myelography in the cases you can find maximum deformity while with, uh, with kyphosis. So the MRI will not decrease in this condition. You have to do the CT uh, myelography. We do also neurophysiological study and the neuromonitoring and psychological assistance of the patient in this age is very important. The association of the deformity and the uh, neurological deficit with this fragile patient with osteoporosis need also to assist him to psychologically. And the standing X-ray films have to be done from the skull down to the hips. And you calculate what is the deformity side, kyphosis, how much degree, lordosis, uh, remaining lordosis, or uh, scoliosis have to be measured exactly and do the calculation of the spine problem. Le, what we are doing for that, because we are thinking about the spinobilbic alignment. There is a relation, fixed relation between the bilbic incidence and the bilbic tilt and the sacral slope. Sacral slope is the line on the upper part of the sacrum is one, and this line is very important and the inclination of the sacrum differ if it's vertical or transverse differ. And this angle with the horizontal makes the sacral slope. We take the perpendicular line from this sacral sphere, the slope down, and another line connected with the center of the head, this is the pelvic incidence. And the pelvic field is the line coming from the center of the slope to the center of the head with the vertical line. So the calculation is the Pelvic incidence equal the pelvic tilt plus the sacral slope. And this is fixed for Mueller with individual variation. Not every pelvic incidence of the same pay of different patient always not the same. It is particular equation for this particular patient. And the pelvic incidence is fixed anatomical value. No matter what is the position of the pelvis is. Angle between a line joining the center of the upper in the blade of S1 to the axis of the femoral head and a line perpendicular to the upper in the blade of S1, as I explained. Sacral slope angle between the end blade of S1 and the horizontal plane. Pelvic tilt is the angle between vertical line and the line joining the middle of the sacral head and the axis of the femoral head. This is a fixed formula. For degenerative scoliosis is painful scoliosis, as we said, aging necessary erodes the cartilage that protects the facet joint like other joints of the body. Joint to become irritable, inflamed, and painful with motion. The types of pain, discogenic pain, facetal uh, joint pain, neurogenic lubrication on the spinal canal due to spinal canal stenosis, and myogenic, myogenic pain due to muscular stress. More patients with degenerative scoliosis than before. Why we have this group of patients? Because we are now in a standard of uh, medical care higher, our life expectation getting better, and the care of the uh, patient with the patient all over the country become better than uh, 50 years before. Now people are living longer than before. They put more stresses on their spine with increased daily activities. Patient became more demanding, less accepting the spine condition as an inevitable part of the aging. They claim 
the right to have a straighter spine, better shape, go participating activity, keep sporting, go to the beach. So the demand is of our patient became uh, increasing by time, not as 50 years before. Osteoporosis causes a degenerative scoliosis by the unequal vertebral compression, fracture, and the wedging of fracture, which can occur without uh, diagnosis. So the compression of the body itself plus the erosion, asymmetrical erosion, can end in degenerative scoliosis. Loss of lordosis and the increased normal kyphosis in the dorsal spine. Treatment option for patients with degenerative scoliosis. Number one, <coughs> the philosophy of treatment of patients with degenerative scoliosis differ from the deformed spine in adolescent and young age. Treatment should be directed to pain management access. Treatment for the compromised neural tissue. So you treat back pain and look after the compromised neural tissue either in the canal or the nerve root and the treatment of the associated osteoporosis and the correction of the curve is not the main concern of the treatment program for elder age group. This has to be clear. Restoration of the lost balance may call for correction of skin. We have to correct this. If we have to concentrate in the either in this pain by minimal intervention rather than to jump up and say, I want to correct the spine for this patient. <coughs> Tools for treatment physiotherapy, swimming, muscle building exercise, bracing, medical treatment for associated medical problems, care with respiratory function, surgical intervention is uh, number five in the program. Every patient condition should be studied very carefully. This surgery should be well planned according to his own condition. Risk factors have to be weighted against the surgical benefit in order to achieve much better quality of life after major surgery at an interview. You can do very big surgery. You are satisfied about the alignment and the patient is not happy by the result at this age. So the evaluation of the patient before surgery, you have to study his problem. Is particular pain, which type and the site of pain, neurological symptoms and the sign, short breath, easy become fatigued, cosmetic appearance, site of the care, fitting of clothes, general overview of the patient health, medical problem, previous surgical correction and fixation. This is very important. Is he a candidate who have deformity and have rigid, long, rigid back on top of this degenerative scoliosis? This is going to be addressed later on in this presentation. A review of the old and recent X-rays for the fiction of the care of progression and the assessment of all the surgery is very important. This patient have surgical intervention before and he developing pain. You have to examine the cause of pain, the fusion, having or not adjacent segment. This is the type of the thinking. Conserve treatment. Is the, is the care itself, assist the care, the degenerative care, mild scoliosis less than 40 degree, I think this, if this unprogressive care, it should be treated by exercise of exercise, muscle exercise, aerobic building uh, uh, muscle program, and being killer and the base. If you have moderate scoliosis, bigger care more than the first one from 40 to 60 degrees, Balance is still maintained. So if he is balanced, mild to this severe degree of pain, treatment by long brace and sport activity, like this patient. You can treat him without surgery if he is not giving symptoms. But when, like this, if he has degenerative spine, and remember, in the elder age group, we have acute disc prolapse on the compromised canal still, and we have treated many cases with simple discectomy for patient at elder age group, simply because he has this disc prolapse acutely and compressing the nerve like the soft one as the younger age group. If you have major curves above 60 degree or more, here 
patient who is clear evidence of curvy progression. If this curvy is progressive, you have to intervene. If it is not progressive, you have to think twice before uh, rushing to make major surgery to correct this patient. This case. patient with clear evidence of curvy progression is the one indicated for surgery. By periodical, I have to ask to begin the periodical examination and the radiological assessment over six months. Thoracic care is that causing the pulmonary function deterioration. This is indication for surgery. If the thoracic care affecting the pulmonary function by finding the pulmonary function is getting affected due to the progression of this care in the dorsal spine, if he is elder, I have to do uh, correction and diffusion to improve his uh, breathing capacity. Lumbar care that causing the neurological deficit, lumbar care with neurological deficit is an indication to interfere surgery. Pain and other symptoms interfering with the quality of life. We think about this, not to correct the care, but to treat the symptoms that affect the quality of life and make it through minimal invasive and less um, uh, sized surgery. Surgical planning and technique. Correction of the genital scoliosis include anterior and posterior surgery sometimes. One stair surgery is more preferable. Correction may carry high surgical risk. Age is not the fact, but the general health and the biology of the patient. Miss techniques, both anterior and posterior, became more popular and more adopted to reduce the time and risk of the major surgery in the general risk use. Non-corrective surgery with short effusion within a balanced spine is recommended by many authors at present time all over the world. Full correction of the deformity with extended fusion is risky for elder patients with different comorbidities. This is what we have to uh, remember. Decompression surgery alone. If you have acute sequestrated disc at an elder stage, elder age, like I said before, within a localized segment, within a balanced spine, the treatment is endoscopic or microscopic or uh, limited interlaminar fenestration technique. You can do minimal intervention by open surgery. If the condition associated with segmental instability, so in this condition we have to do localized diffusion. Localized increase in segmental instability means within a balanced spine means short segment fixation for this segment, not necessarily to do whole correction as we see abroad nowadays. If you go to America and there's a presentation in every place. They treat the whole spine with very long, extensive uh, surgery, and this is not the situation which we should recommend in our cases. Minimally invasive decompression, neurospinal endoscopic decompression, these are many tools in our hand nowadays, and you have to use it for our elder, uh, fragile elder is the patient. The technique are not risky as open decompression or short fuse. This technique could be repeated if needed after a period of pain cure. I mean, you can do endoscopic once, twice, three times in the patient extended life if he have another complaint with this particular disc or other disc above or below the previously treated one. Limited open decompression. Limited open decompression with interspinal or interlaminar devices, the spacer. Uh, you know the space after, of course. Localized open fusion to certain motion segment. Minimally invasive technique for anterior release, including the thoracoscopic release, decompression and diffusion through thoracoscopic intervention. Minimally invasive transepidicular fixation have been practiced over the last two decades now with successful results. So we can do minimally invasive fixation for this patient without major cell. Minimally invasive telephone. Now available and uh, applicable and easier uh, with the new retractor and uh, the tools help to do the minimal intervention in a certain corridor without jeopardizing 
زي ما سيد وزيت ماتش بليدنج وزيت ايفن جو ريترو بريتونيال ان ماسيف واي باي اوبن سيرجري بات يو كان جو ويز ذا لونج ريفراكتورز اند ميك لايف ايزي ثرو في سمول انسيجن جاست 5 سنتيمتر ماكسيم All of these techniques have reduced the surgical morbidity and the complication or the loss of effects. And these techniques have to be adopted in treating degenerative problems. Degenerative curve problems. The curve is present. But what is the source of pain in this curve? If the spine is balanced and the curve, the degenerative curve is present, we have to think in minimal intervention to sort the patient to problem, and the patient is what the problem is mainly his vein, radicular, or colonication. Limited decompression and diffusion. Judgment depends on the degree of local segment instability. Versa, the stability as a different curve, curve segment. The stabilization and the motion above the curve. Fusion with stabilization technique is superior to stage the decompression and diffusion at a later stage. I mean, one stage surgery is severe in this risky aged group. Solo decompression alone by laminectomy is very frequently complicated by further collapse of the care and development of new vein, more severe vein due to the iatrogenic instability. Another fusion surgery is required for this patient to treat the pain and the atrogenic instability after same laminic. So don't recommend, we don't recommend uh, massive laminectomy, two, three level laminectomy for degenerative scoliosis without fusion and stabilization. Cave abrogation is very common if the compression alone have been done at the apex of the cave. Isolated decompression at the bottom of the rigid cave at L45 and L5 is S1, which is termed as a transitional signal, may end up with imbalanced situation with pain and the curve of rotation. So we have to calculate the whole spine balance and uh, correct the spine in the sagittal and uh, coronal plane if we are going to address fixation and the correction, we have to be thorough, examine patient, and the decision has to be uh, pre-planned and explained and stressed uh, in the study and explained to the patient and have uh, to avoid the risky situation. So it is a major uh, situation and you have to keep this for a very limited number in our patient, in our practice for the certain patient. Care of a correction procedure. No correction is required in the presence of balanced spine in front and plane and such that alignment. The presence of all the uncorrected adolescent aged care needs careful calculation before correction of the regenerative care. Why? The rigid all the care cannot adapt itself to the corrected new position you created by correcting the scoliotic curve, the general scoliosis. That will, be, uh, will end up in the chronic vein with global imbalance. So the upper segment is not resilient, will not make second change according to the rigidity you have reduced by fixing the general spot. In this condition, you have to calculate the whole spot. Cervical, dorsal, lumbar, build the lumbar junction. All of this have to be uh, calculated and make long fixation, including the dorsal spine. You may need also to correct the all the deformity if it is more kyphotic than it should be. Flat back is a problem. After you get a patient with flat back syndrome with scoliosis and degenerative scoliosis in the lower part of the spine. Need an extensive release of the posterior element with facet joint osteotomy. We may have to do anterior release also and anterior columnar resection with edge, especially at the lumbosacral junction, is, necess is necessarily to create or lead create the lumbar lordosis as L5 as well. This is an example of the flag. Selective segmental osteotomy. 
mostly transmedicular resection osteotomy, vertebral decancellation osteotomy, wedging osteotomy for associated cause, total vertebrectomy, vertebrectomy in one stage or two stages. Vertebral column resection is not necessarily needed in the genital scoliosis, but we can have little number of cases need this vertebral column if there is severe kyphosis with that scoliosis. Types of very simple treatments like Smith Peterson and the Bonte. This can correct up to four to seven degree per one level. And the multiple uh, Bonte and multiple Smith, Smith Peterson, as I asked the professor uh, from India, can make you correct big degree of deformity that is multiple level rather than do the one level correction by transvedicular or uh, vertebricular subtraction or vertebrectomy total vertebrectomy or or decision. But if we have major surgery with rigidity, we do the osteotomy for the rigid, uncorrectable curves which lost the elasticity to compensate when you do this direction to get extension of the curve of the of the disc space. In this condition, you are obliged to do the osteotomy from posterior to shorten the curve of the spine from behind and make combination fixation. In this condition, you can correct up to 35 degree at one level. We can do osteotomy at two levels if the deformity is very severe and we need it to be done at two levels. So in this condition, you can do the column medical subtraction osteotomy, and this is the difficult situation you are going to be faced with, but this is not the case uh, with the general scoliosis in every case. Extensive fixation and diffusion. The extended fusion 2L5S1, it takes the movement of the lumbar spine. It is the most critical signal to be considered whether or not to be fused, included in the tooth, which L5 is one. Because if you fix this, the fusion mass is extended down, the stress is going to be shifted to the sacroiliac joint, even to the hips. So if you can make the fusion short at L5 or L4, that is much better. It is the most difficult fusion to be achieved. You have to have 36 circumferential fusion at L5 S1 with anterior cage is the best to avoid non-union and to avoid the kyphosis at this level or loss of lordosis. If we are reconstructing, we have to put a cage at L5 S1 and make the spine lordotic and in better sagittal balance. Lumbosarcal rejection is usually degenerated if you stop above. So if it is degenerated, Severely degenerated, you are obliged to include it in the fusion mass. But if it is mobile, you can step at L5. The storm fusion at L5 brought a lot of stereotypes in the ramus after junction. It's extension with the fusion to the chakra. Have an impact on the sacroiliac joint and the hip joint. Passive joint arthrosis at L5 is one, and the transitional vertebral obliquity and the rotation are quite common. Long horse spine X-ray film is important to blend for the proper extension of the fusion for the global correction of the spine. The global correction of the spine, not the segment, the lower segment only or the upper segment only, at such an inter is group, which is risky operation because the patient have comorbidities. Don't include extra motion segment in the fusion mass based on the radiological finding only. You have to examine. If it is painful source of pain, you have to include it. And if it is not source of pain and keeping its motion, you have to preserve this vertebra or this segment as much as you can. The inclusion of the lumbosacral segment in the fusion is always questionable. <clears throat> the stopping with the fixation and the fusion as thoracolumbar. Fixation to dorsal 12 is not accepted as it is the transitional site. How to avoid the junction kyphosis? You cannot avoid junction kyphosis if the fusion stops at dorsal 12. 
hat fixation in this condition uh, to avoid junction kyphosis, to avoid collapse of the spine on top of your fusion. And this can come out after short refraining two months. Fixation should be extended to D9 or sometimes to D6, even in some cases to D4. Do you see how the extension to restore the balance and to have global correction in elder age? It is very long fusion, and I have seen hundreds of X rays in America with this technique. And of course, we are familiar with that uh, through our webinars now uh, about this very long extended fusion with. Uh, as a patient with osteoporosis and have a lot of complication for this extended fusion. Global balance restoration is essential as the spine is stiff, not mobile, by the generation, not like the adolescent spine that keeps the resilience of the disc and can compensate after the fusion. The problem encountering with surgical correction to do this big surgery at this elder age group, it is the length of fusion segment and the length of time of surgery itself, inclusion of the lumbosacral junction with its complication, higher level fusion, the spinal segment adjacent to the fusion, and junction kyphosis, which can occur on top of the long fusion. This is why we, we advise if you have to stop uh, correcting the lumbar care and you're going to end the road at dorsal 12, no, I'm sorry, go to 9, go to 6, dorsal 6 not stop at will at all, because you find the thorax is, is kept, get down, and the patient will be more perfect as this uh, transitional zone. <clears throat> the study is a previous scoliosis surgery for this patient. One or multiple osteotomies for surgical balance restoration is mandatory in this condition. General medical condition of the patient. Is the patient to have osteoporosis? Is, are you going to make this instrumentation in osteoporotic bone in the, in the case like this, give the patient a long trace and don't do fixation in osteoporotic bone quality. doesn't hold this screws, so don't put the screw because after uh, yani one month, two months <laughs> maximum, you get this screws out or it gets out by yourself. It's going to be shameful to you to do that. Outcome and complications. Most of the complications are related to the bad selection of the lesion for major surgical correction. Wrong planning, wrong surgical techniques, long approach related to the complication. And there is approach, really approach related to complication. If you have the complication, as Dr. Salad have mentioned, the posterior makes a muscle in a, uh, denervation. The anterior has, uh, can have some complication related to the alias, the thorax, uh, the pleura, the lung. So this major surgery have major complication to occur, and the surgeon have to know, and the patient and uh, relative have to know. Also, you have um, the problem of implant failure, which can occur easily if the, the implant is stressed by insufficient bone grafting or the adjacent level, uh, which is quite common, and the pseudoarthrosis is quite common. So you need to have bone substitutes and a lot of uh, stimulator for the osteoconduction and also induction. After surgery and video operative professional active. Patient satisfaction is linked with his muscle power. If you get very old man with bad muscle in his back and his hip, I think he is not the candidate for this fixation because the result of your fusion ended up by weak muscle and the patient is cannot move, cannot move if you have to select the patient. You have to have good quality patient for this operation. Limited intervention by vertebral augmentation and slow medical treatment, grace, and uh, I have a case like this, you will see, 76 years old, the lady attended with low and the mid back pain over the last three months. At this time, she has this operation, uh, I think about 10 years now. Has a history of L4-5 case fusion 15 years before I have seen it. Radiological examination shows loss of lumbar lugosis, high degree of dorsal lumbar kyphosis, Wedge combination fracture at dorsal 12 and dorsal 11, and this was the source of her recent pain. But the deformity is clear, and he has he have previous surgery. So what to do? I think about restoring her balance and correcting her spine and do very long fixation. My answer was no. 
I did vertebral augmentation and long uh, saracolumbar orthosis, and I gave alendronate drug and uh, subcutaneous uh, fat, uh, injection for stimulating the uh, the treatment of osteoporosis. And osteoporosis by itself is a source of pain and will be could be a source of deformity because of the fracture of the vertebra on the lateral and medial side. This is the case. Kyphotic, and you have all the operation. This operation was done for that in the United States, 15 years, I'm almost about uh, 25 years now, because I have treated it here 10 years before. And I gave only <coughs> augmentation of the compressed fracture, and she lift heavy to the states. Decision making, back pain with mild symptoms, spinal canal stenosis, had decompression and short fusion six years ago, starting having a new mid back pain with minimal leg pain. Investigation and the treatment. I gave her a brace and the medical treatment. She was happy as she also refused to have this major extensive surgery in the back, which I don't recommend strongly, except if there is total loss or major loss of the balance in the sagittal and the lumbar bone. But she was happy with this kyphosis. I put the brace, she left my clinic very happy. So not every patient have to be advised to have major surgery because you are not guaranteeing that after this surgery, the quality of life of this patient at the age of 70 or 75 going to be much better. So don't gamble by doing extensive, very extensive surgery in poor quality uh, bone and uh, doing major surgery in comorbidity and the risk patient for you and for himself. Global assessment of the different care, the whole lens standing history film is very important. Global calculation of the dorsal kyphosis, the residual lumbar lipidosis, if still preserved, the spinovelvic diameter, parameter, Sacral sloping, pelvic tilt, pelvic incident, and the pelvic incident is a fixed uh, angle for this particular patient. But the different al what is that changeable, is the pelvic tilt and sacral slope. Sacral slope is tilt, is fixed. So what is changeable is the pelvic tilt. C2 posterior upper corner is when blunt line is very important. If it is positive or negative, the magnitude. The angle of correction should be equal to the uh, pelvic incident plus 19 degrees. That will restore the lost balance by restoration of the normal lordosis, which is normally between 50 to 60 degrees. This calculation has to be in mind if you're planning for doing the surgery, putting the whole spine balance in your consideration. This long X ray film. Now we have digital X-ray film. We haven't have this. This is X-ray film is, is American X-ray films, but we don't have very long X-ray film like this. And we now have digital X-ray, which can help us to do the whole spine X-ray. I, as I show you, the extensive extended uh, extended fixation, and of course they would bone graph. You can see the graph. Here we can put uh, very long fixation, but sometimes they underestimate the value of the graph in some practice, and this also make me afraid if you do very long extended fusion and uh, don't put the sufficient graph. And you have osteoporosis, so the union rate is not high. So we should avoid this extensive uh, operation, except in case of loss of balance and the operation is mandatory and have to be explained. This is a long fixation, but this case is, is good because he restored the lumbar lordosis. In conclusion, the relationship between clinical presentation and the basomorphology and degenerative scoliosis is still remaining a challenge to the spine surgery. It's still remaining a challenge to spine surgery. To understand the basology and the physiological exchange as a result of this pathology, is not clear. It's not clear, and it is a challenge because if you treat something is not clear, it is going to challenge for you 
and for equipment, and of course, uh, for the patient and society. Full analysis of the major signs and the symptoms, as instability, stenosis, unbalanced deformity. What is the cause of pain? If it is instability and the limited instability, limited fusion. If it is stenosis, decompression. If it is unbalanced, unbalanced deformity, this long fixation and the possible careful progression is very important in surgery. The complex pain pattern varies between back pain, communication pain, sensory pain, motor pain, weakness, professional activity, affection. Should be, all of this should be analyzed to corrective surgery in the same stage. If it is neglected, the global balance could not be achieved. Every patient probably should be individually analyzed to tailor how it is required to be Patient satisfaction through change. This is failure from you, <laughs> from the procedure, and the patient is not happy. So why, why, what is the indication of the operation at such a risky and the critical age? Sometimes it's not easy to gain the best result at such ages with multifactorial problem. Although you are a skillful surgeon, you did the best, and the time is good, but the patient is not satisfied because muscle power restoration after surgery is very important. We have to be uh, sent to good physiotherapist to and the rehabilitation program to improve his muscle. Optimal results versus limitation. In our country, like any other country over the years, we have shortage of the images and the software system to calculate the angles and help you in your clinic to get uh, helped by these images and this can shortage in the proper setup and the instrumentation to do this extensive surgery. No allograft availability in every place. Bone morphogenic protein is very expensive and you are in need for this in big amount to have very long fixation with very long bone graft uh, field to be applied. Bone graft substitutes are not osteoinduct, it is osteoconduct. We, you and you are in need also for osteoinduct. Neuromonitoring is still not used routinely in every place. Immunocompromised patients at elder age are very common now. Patients have heart, liver, kidney disease are quite common in different societies. No standard insurance system for all population in many places. You have this operation for uh, under the insurance system because it is very expensive one. No standard training programs and specialized spine fellowships at all the countries. No standardization. So the decision making over this risky patient will be varied from one surgeon to other surgeon in the same country according to the previous skill, the training, the training fellowship which he passed through. This, this is a problem also. We are not speaking the same language. The safe and the effectiveness <coughs> and the effectiveness of the inter effective intervention. This misintervention. Miss technique. New tools to control pain, pain management program. Miss and open neuro spinal decompression. Localized or limited segment diffusion. Miss sleep with tubular retractors. Vertebral injection technique for osteoporotic vertebra. Major surgery to correct the loss of sagittal bone is not the only option to treat painful degenerative scoliosis at elder age. The operation is risky and could precipitate more complications. Good study of each case was proper calculation of the degrees of risk are so important to learn different degrees. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Maziat. Thank you so much, sir. We have uh, two questions for you, sir, from uh, Dr. Nada. Uh, when to decide that the patient of flat back have to go to the surgery? I have to assist the patient 
by the long-standing X-ray films, and this, and uh, we decide if we have lost the balance and in need for correction. And this flat back surgery have a mobile segment above and the blue this side or not. This assessment is very important by doing a stress film, long-standing X-ray film, if you is the imbalance in the coronal and the sagittal, and the need for the surgery, if it is limited uh, osteotomy and doing the fusion, or you're going to reconstruct from the beginning with inclusion of the old fixed segment in the new uh, program and extended fusion. Yes, and the second question from Dr. Nada also, uh, and for the physiotherapy, does it has nothing to do with this case? Physiotherapy is not a treatment of, of curves because the curves are rigid and will not be improved by physiotherapy. But the physiotherapy improves the quality of muscle, improves the respiratory function, and improves the patient's ability to move, swim, participate in activity. This helps us to improve the quality of the patient, either to have operation or to improve, improve his quality and uh, he may ask not to have the operation. But physiotherapy is not a treatment of degenerative sclerosis. It helps the muscle and improves the general uh, quality and it could be treat the patient symptoms sometime by improving the uh, quality of the muscle and the blood supply to the muscle and the respiration uh, through the improving the respiratory mechanism and function. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, do we have any other questions to Professor Mazid? Thank you so much, sir. We will uh, move now to the uh, next speaker. Our next speaker will be uh, Professor Hossam Salah from Cairo University, Egypt. Professor Hossam. Yes, good evening, uh, Professor Ashab. Uh, thank you very evening, much sir. for your invitation and for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, I'm not sure if there, I have much to say after this very long uh, lecture of uh, Professor Maziad. Um But if you are ready to listen to what I have to say, I will go ahead. We are ready, sir. <laughs> okay. Um, my talk is about um, surgical strategies in complex spine deformities, and uh, I have nothing to disclose. Now, severe rigid scoliosis is uh, uh, commonly defined as a main curve that's above 90 degrees with flexibility less than 25%. However, the focus uh, group of uh, Professor uh, Bawachi in Ghana have given a definition of a curve that's above 100 degrees and um, this group of patients um, are actually got dip mixed radiologies. Some have been even subjected to previous surgeries. Some are complicated or have had unsatisfactory results. Um, going back to the focus uh, hospital classification, they, they define these into two groups. One, where they, there is a the, the, the deformity is above 100 degrees, either in the coronal plane or sagittal plane or in both. And, uh, but the upper and lower end the vertebra are above and below the, the apex. So this is, doesn't make a, a, an omega or half an omega. While the two type two one is, is a, where there is a half omega, where the proximal, uh, the upper end vertebra is below the apex or, or the, the distal end vertebra is, uh, is, is above the apex or both which makes the full uh, omega uh, deformity. Um, it's very important in these patients to do a very good general assessment. These patients are commonly nutritionally compromised. They commonly have a, um, a respiratory affection. Uh, they may have other congenital anomalies or neurological disorders. They're also affected psychologically and socially because of the severe deformity. Um, the spine assessment goes along the standard assessment uh, of all the spine deformity patients where they look at the overall posture, the, st the stature or height, the, the deformity components, looking at the coronal and sagittal balance, the trunkal shift, the rib hump, the low in asymmetry, shoulder levels and pelvic level. And of course, 
uh, you always assess the neurological status, the presence of pain, and also uh, the different ideology uh, causing this severe deformity. These are some pictures showing um, um, some of the severe curves uh, that we will be looking at to see how, how bad this patient is with the pulled out metal with the scarring. Um, for radiological assessment, you, you do always the standard full length x-rays and MRI scan to check for the cord, but it's also important to use CT scans because they help you assess the pedicle diameters and also um, can show you areas where there has been surgically induced or spontaneous fusion. Uh, you also look at the anchor points in general, and also it's very important to assess flexibility with traction films. So severe deformity patients should, should have assessment of the flexibility by traction films. Um, this is an example with a severe curve, and this is what the traction film looks like, and there is some uh, improvement. It also, um, traction films also help you see the anatomy better. If you look at the pedicles on the left side uh, uh, photograph, um, you can see uh, more of the anatomy because the traction uh, allows the unwinding of the deformity and allows you to see the anatomy in a better shape. Um, when, when you are embarking on surgery, you should have goals. The goals are obviously achieving balance, both coronally and sagittally, having a level shoulder and a level pelvis, uh, dealing with the limb hump at, and obtaining low in symmetry. Achieving all of these goals with high success and the least possible complication rates. Um, when, I, when I look at severe rigid scoliosis, I always look at three possible uh, areas of getting uh, loosening the deformity to get the correction. So we either look at a release of some sort or a vertebral body osteotomy or the use of traction. And indeed using these in different combinations. And we'll go through these uh, different techniques uh, with some examples. If you look at releases, you can do the classic anterior release, which is becoming less commonly done nowadays. Um, posterolateral discectomy, it's an, it's an anterior release done with an extra plural approach through a posterolateral access to the thoracic discs. Concave rib osteotomies, spinal osteotomies, temporary internal distraction, the use of traction preoperatively or after release, as we will talk in a second and also using all of these in different combinations. Let's look at this example. This is a 26 year old with a previous surgery that was infected, implants removed, and the, she presents with very severe deformity. You could look at how bad she looks um, with a truncal shift to the right, um, asymmetric shoulders, a huge uh, um, um, rib hump, and you can see how, how horrible the x-rays uh, look and the, the pelvic obliquity. Um, Surgery was planned here by doing uh, staged and anti-release was done, then followed by multiple posterior pantes and a, and a posterior instrumentation and correction. And you could look at the difference in the x-rays. These are the post-operative x-rays, two years post-op, and you can compare these to the post to the pre-operative x-rays. She had a good clinical result um, following this surgery. Um, posterior lateral discectomy has been described um, uh, I have used it a few times, and it is equally effective uh, to anterior release through a formal thoracotomy or a thoracoscopic approach. This is an example. Um, this is an X-ray of a 20-year-old male who had neglected congenital scoliosis, major curve measuring 115, and on traction just going down to 100. And uh, the surgery was: you can look at the truncal shift, the rear pump, and the waist asymmetry, and the the, the how bad the, the the deformity is with truncal shift and all that. And um, the surgery involved multiple pantes using convex costectomies, of course, and postulated discectomies at five levels, and of course, uh, selection of different anchors. You look at the traction films here, and this is the post-operative uh, clinical photographs, having uh, obtained a very good result compared to the pre-op. The patient gained nine centimeters, have had level shoulders, and the waist and hump improved dramatically. Now, another technique of doing a release is the concave rib osteotomy. It's something that uh, have been described previously. We have a publication with a, a group of my colleagues published in the European Spine Journal in 2007. Um, we have used it in 78 patients and have got good results with an incidence of 
pulmonary complications of around 11.5%. Um, this is an example. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the quality of the x-rays. It's an x-ray done uh, many, many years back, and the surgery was done many years ago. Um, but it, this is a patient that uh, involved, used uh, concave rib osteotomy with a good result. I've, I've stopped using concave rib osteotomy in these patients because um, concave rib osteotomy and having worked on the convex side of the chest and doing a costectomy, then you've affected both chest cages and may actually lead to severe respiratory compromise uh, and get you into trouble with the patients. Um, this is the uh, Frank Schwab Comprehensive Anatomical Spinal Osteotomy Classification, and um, uh, it's, it's important to remember it. Um, and vertebral body osteotomies are starting from the type 3, a PSO, and the extended PSOs into the VCR and the uh, more than one level VCR. Um, this is um, a 12-year-old with severe early onset scoliosis, neglected management, um, a, a very high a cervical thoracic curve. Um, you can see a horrible um, deformity um, causing uh, unacceptable appearance at all. And um, this is the traction films, shows some improvement in appearance, but still with this, um, a very severe deformity despite the traction. And the surgery, multiple pontes, a posterior instrumentation from C5 to L1. And this is the result we had um, postoperatively. Uh, compared to the preoperative x-ray, um, looks good, um, but on clinical grounds, um, you will see a, a, a dramatic improvement in the appearance of the kid um, after the surgery. This is a 13-year-old um, who had an AIS, which looked quite innocent. However, the surgery was not very well planned, had surgery elsewhere, and um, failed instrumentation, infection, pullout, and removal of the implants. Um, just nine years later presents like this with this very severe uh, kyphotic uh, deformity. Um, these are the x-rays. This is how it looks. Main problem is, is the thoracic, very severe thoracic kyphosis, uh, measuring over 124 degrees. And the plan was to do a VCR T7 with instrumentation from T2 to L4. This is um, post-operative x-rays. Um, proximal distal anchors using some wires as well and using the VCR T7. And this is how he looked um, on the right side compared to the pre-op appearance, a significant improvement in the appearance with a good outcome of the surgery. This is another 21-year-old young lady from Chad, had the neurofibromatosis scoliosis in, in Saudi. Um, a patient had implant failure, skin breakdown, implant removal, and um, six months after the index surgery, presents uh, four years later with this uh, deformity. Uh, previous surgery, kyphotic, kyphoscoliotic, um, with a bad appearance. Um, patient um, uh, was treated with um, a PSO, which allow 45 degrees of the correction of the deformity with anchors using uh, hooks and wires at the top and pedicle screws at the bottom with an acceptable um, outcome. This is another patient who's a 27-year-old, uh, neurofibromatous scoliosis, extensive duralectasia from T11 to L3, had surgery at the age of 16, another surgery in France at the age of 19, and that is how she looked like. You can see the obliquity of the pelvis. You can see the single rod with one screw at the bottom um, and um, the kyphosis, the truncal shift, and all that. Uh, and even the thoracopelvic impingement, as you can see on the right pelvis, where the thoracic cage is hitting the iliac wing. Um, uh, this is the careful assessment. The main problem is the pelvic obliquity and the coronal imbalance. You can easily get very overwhelmed with such x-rays. But if you look at the problems and you define and an analyze them, then you can do a plan that's realistic, that can achieve the goals and obtain a good result for the patient. And that's what we did. Um, we did a, um, a revision surgery, an asymmetric PSO, um, sacral ALR iliac screws at the pelvis, uh, doing the osteotomy at L4 below the dural ectasia and extending the screws to the uh, mid-dorsal level and obtaining an acceptable result. And if you look at the pre-op, x-rays and you look at the amount of correction of the pelvic obliquity and the amount of correction of the sag the coronal uh, imbalance that has changed her life
What about traction? Um, traction, does it help you correct? I think it does to some extent, but the real values of traction is that it actually helps you in other areas. It helps you improve the nutritional status of the patient, the respiratory function, and even stabilize a neurological deterioration of the patient while you're planning the surgery. So many different things. How long would you use the traction pre-op? Would you use it intra-op? Would you use it after releases? What, what kind of weight you would do? So many different variations and so many different publications. Um, this is a 22-year-old who had neglected AIS with severe deformity, according to the focus uh, classification. It's a 2P, um, which is a half omega. He's got a, a coronal angle of 180 degrees, a Cobb angle of over 100. And you look at the x-rays, and this is how it looks, and these are the, how um, the traction films are not doing much, really. Uh, for regarding flexibility. And uh, four weeks of halo gravity traction, we have reached 25% of body weight, but he could not tolerate uh, more than that. And this is uh, doing, after doing posterior multiple pantes, convex costoplasty, posterior lateral discectomies, use of different ankle spedical screws, sublaminar wires, and a combination of inside to bending rod rotation maneuver. And this is what we got. Uh, post-op, and you compare this with the with the pre-op, then you can be kind of happy after the surgery, and even if you look at the appearance, um, that is, uh, uh, apologize for the quality of the pictures, but it just shows you the idea, a huge difference in the appearance compared to the pre-op uh, photographs. So the take-home message um, really is, um, these are patients that need very accurate assessment, you need to optimize patient's health before the surgery. You have to define the goals of your surgery. Um, don't get overwhelmed about, with the x-rays. Just be realistic and define what you want to do and achieve. Prepare, obviously, a variety of anchors. Use neuromonitoring, which is a must. Um, you can't do such surgeries without neuromonitoring. Um, traction can be helpful, um, but importantly, be realistic and be safe. And it's a, a very important to communicate with the patient and family openly and clearly. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Hossam Salah, uh, Cairo University, Egypt, for this very interesting talk. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. If we have any questions to Professor Hossam. Okay, thank you so much, sir. We have no questions. Uh, we will move now to the uh, next speaker. The, uh, our next speaker will be Professor uh, Mamko from uh, Turkey. Professor Mamko, you are with us. Yeah, hello. How are you? Uh, I'm fine, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us tonight, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Professor Hassan, would you please uh, stop sharing screen, sir? I'm not. Well, I'm trying to stop the screen. I'm very sorry. I'm trying to. Thank you so much. Can you stop the, the screen of Professor Hossam? Thank you, thank you, Professor Hassan. Uh, Professor Monkey, are you ready? Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Thank uh, you so much. Um, yeah. 
Good, good evening. I'm Dr. Çiğdem Mumcu, neurosurgeon in Istanbul. Uh, today I'm going to talk about patient safety in UBE, uh, some useful uh, tips. Uh, to start with, I'll describe UBE, uh, then I'll e explain the base concept of this technique. After that, I'll uh, talk about complications and how to prevent it. Then I will present some cases. Finally, I'll summarize my presentation. Uh, spinal endoscopy has a long history, over 15 years, uh, and is developed uh, with well-known uh, PELD, PCLD, and unilateral techniques. However, uh, recently, biportal endoscopic technique, which is called UBE, has been more popular. In the last uh, 10 years, endoscopic uh, surgery has had such a great progress uh, that today many spine surgeries can uh, be converted to UBE. Uh, it is based uh, on arthroscopic surgery. Uh, let's take a look at the UBE history. Uh, in 1996, uh, Dr. Antony from Argentina published the first article about translaminar uh, lumbar epidural endoscopy um, only for lumbar discectomy. Then in uh, 2001, uh, Dr. Abdul Ghaffar described it too. In 2003, Dr. Am from South Korea presented uh, endoscopic lumbar discectomy using the UBE technique. Between 2003 to 2013, UBE surgery is extended from simple discectomy to treatment of stenosis and even fusion surgery. Uh, let's uh, move on to talk about the uh, advantages of UBE. The merit of UBE is more familiar to spine surgeons. UBE and microsurgery are uh, almost the same approach uh, in terms of instruments, anatomy, and surgical results. UBE view is clearer and safer. UBE provides a good vis visualization of contralateral, uh, sublaminar, and foraminal areas and it has a wide range of indications. We can use all in, uh, surgical instruments without any limitations. Furthermore, uh, it is more beneficial uh, for the patients. Uh, let's uh, watch these videos. Uh, the video on the left is UBE discectomy, and the one on the right is microscopic discectomy. Uh, UBE view is much clearer uh, and it also has a more blood free vision. That means clean view uh, makes the surgery easier and safer. And here uh, uh, are the uh, disadvantages. Uh, UBE is great endoscopic procedure, but it is technically difficult, especially uh, neurosurgeons might uh, not be familiar with arthroscopic equipment. So the surgeons need to be trained uh, to specifically learn to uh, learn the manual skills. UBE surgery has a long learning curve. Uh, to do UBE surgery, you should have a zero degree endoscope and RF device, shaver system, irrigation uh, system, and special UBE instruments. Uh, UBE has a wide range of indications. All kinds of degenerative spine disease, uh, such as herniated disc, spinal stenosis, uh, fusion surgery, revision surgery, facet cyst, and so on, can be treated by UBE. Uh, for the moment, uh, we cannot operate intradural pathologies and spinal infection by UBE. However, uh, in the near future, uh, we expect to achieve this. When you start UBE, we recommend you operate with easy discectomy cases at the level L5-S1, uh, which has inter uh, interlaminar window uh, that is much wider, as it gives you much maneuverability. Later on, start with discectomy on the level uh, of L4-5. By practicing more, uh, then you can do with lateral recess decompression. And when you get more practice uh, with using Burderil, you can start spinal canal uh, stenosis. Then finally, you can perform with posterior, posterior foraminotomy in the cervical spine or uh, far lateral uh, discectomy. 
uh, you will gain uh, gain enough experience in your first 50 cases. Uh, okay, now I will talk about uh, some tips of UBE surgery. Uh, first of all, uh, operative preparing is very important for patient safety. Uh, we should perform uh, UBE under general anesthesia. It is better for both uh, the patient and the surgeon. The patient must be in prone position with a neutral rolling pad. Also, 5 to 10 degree head-up position is necessary to protect optimum ISP during the surgery. Uh, Wilson frame uh, allows a kyphotic posture, uh, which would uh, increase epidural pressure and lead uh, to more epidural bleeding. We recommend you not to use it. Uh, the next issue is about your team. Uh, your team is very important as well. There are lots of details to prepare before starting the UBE. That means your nurses need to know how to set up uh, the water pump of the irrigation, irrigation system, how to connect your video system, and so on. It is not only the surgeon who must be trained with the manual skills, um, skills but also your team, your nurses, your technical staff for the final success. Uh, the next issue uh, I'd like to focus on uh, is the, uh, the technique. In here, you can see uh, the operat operative steps. First one is skin marking, which is the basis for UBE. Uh, there are two portals. Uh, one is the working portal. The other is the scope portal. Uh, these two portals must create a triangle above the lamina, uh, which is very crucial. Second step is to create working space. Uh, for this, we uh, clear upper lamina, uh, interlaminar space, and lower lamina of soft tissue with the dilator. Uh, the next uh, one is the irrigation system. It is essential to know how to use uh, the irrigation system for fluid control, uh, clear view, and bleeding control for patient safety. When you prepare the inter, uh, interlaminar space, the following step is similar uh, to open microdiscectomy or micro decompression. Uh, this video uh, show us preparing the skin portal. For uh, interlaminar approach, first we need to uh, determine the midline. Then the second line should be drawn on the me medial margin of upper pedicle. Third line should be in uh, the disc level. These lines should form a triangle in the center of spinous process. Distance of two portals is about two to three centimeter. After the skin, fa uh, skin and fa uh, fascia uh, in incisions, uh, the two the dilators are inserted through the lamina, and uh, then the dilators uh, create a triangle on, to, uh, on the upper lamina. Then muscle uh, detachment is made uh, by uh, the dilator and the distal margin uh, of the lamina and medial side of the facet joint before uh, ins inserting an endoscope. It is necessary to prepare, uh, prepare uh, enough uh, visual space. At the end, the scope and RF probe are inserted through the incisions then uh, are created V-shaped working mode uh, on the upper lamina. Finally, potential space is uh, made with RF uh, so, uh, triangulation is crucial. If you make good triangulation, you can see the instrument in the screen. If you don't, that makes the surgery difficult. Uh, irrig uh, irrigation system applies water flow continuously, so to control inflow and outflow is crucial. Uh, we should keep the pressure uh, 30 to 50 millimeter uh, mercury for patient safety. Controlled continuous outflow can make an op uh, optimal hydrostatic pressure. If outflow isn't proper, epidural pressure will increase and lead to some CNS complications. A good outflow gets clear view. Moreover, uh, we can check the bleeding. If you uh, lose, uh, if you lose anatomic orientation, the procedure uh, becomes risky. 
we always need to know exactly where we are. Uh, we need to have full orientation. If you feel you are getting lost, you should convert to microsurgery. Uh, high hydrostatic pressure can cause CNS problems uh, such as uh, headache, posterior neck pain, seizure, blind, uh, blindness due to retinal, uh, retinal bleeding, uh, and so on. Uh, RF ablation may cause thermal injury on muscles and cord as well. It does especially protein denaturation at between uh, 40 to uh, 70 Celsius. That is why RF device must be used for a short period. If you ca uh, cause a more a muscular damage uh, by RF, it can lead to muscle uh, edema and uh, then infection. Uh, if you want to get a good result, uh, outflow should be continuous. At the same time, your surgical view should be clear. The scopic, uh, the scopic hand can be moved uh, in all directions. If you go uh, deeper and closer to pathology, you can reach a clear vision. That is important. Uh, to keep uh, optimum ISP, uh, uh, first, Patient should be uh, in the head up position. Second, we always have to control the outflow. For this, the nurse holds the UBE retractor. A continuous output uh, prevents complication. Uh, to prevent RF damage, you can relatively touch on a uh, dura of lumbar sp spine, but on cervical spine, don't. You should avoid touching directly on dura of cord level. Use RF for uh, a short time and repeatedly. Uh, let's talk about how we can control bleeding. Uh, epidural vein usually bleeds. If there is bleeding, you should move the scope much deeper. Also, you can insert the suction tip here like a natural drain, then fluid uh, and blood will exit. Or you can coagulate directly with RF. If it doesn't work, you can use bone wax, gel foam, and so on. If you don't know where the focus of bleeding is, close the irrigation and wait or just two or uh, t uh, three minutes. A clotting will happen spontaneously then you can restart. Uh, in this slide, you can see my UBE cases that I per, uh, performed for two years. In the beginning, I faced serious complications such as bilateral visual loss, epidural hematoma, and so on. I've learned how to avoid complications uh, gradually. Uh, now I will explain some vital details for a safe surgery. Now uh, uh, we will move on uh, to look at some of my cases. This case, uh, this case was my first UBE case. He was 28 years old and had a right uh, leg pain due to L5-S1 uh, disc herniation. I performed UBE two years ago. Uh, there was no dural injury or any complication during the surgery. A post-operative, uh, a few hours later, uh, bilateral visual loss uh, was observed. He was immediately referred to the Department of Ophthalmology. He had bilateral retinal hem uh, hemorrhage, uh, hemorrhage. In this slide, you can see his fundus photograph of a uh, optic disc. Uh, he was applied a uh, YAG laser in both eyes. One month later, his visual acuity uh, increased uh, and the hemorrhage uh, remarkably recovered. Uh, my second case is a 34-year-old woman. Uh, she had left leg pain for uh, three months due to L45 disc herniation. Uh, Pre-operative MRI shows uh, the rupture disc at L45. Uh, this is another section of preparative MRI. Uh, after the UBE surgery, right side uh, surgery, ruptured disc was totally removed. Uh, there was no dural uh, injury or any complication during the surgery. Postoperative MRI showed a good decompression of uh, the spinal canal. 
but uh, she uh, developed right foot drop after the surgery because uh, because of uh, excessive L5 nerve root retraction on the right side. She undertook physical therapy uh, for a couple of months. Uh, then she completely recovered uh, six months later. Uh, here you can see uh, her intraoperative vi video. Uh, sorry. I'm trying to open. Uh, sorry. Hmm. Here uh, you can see uh, her interpretive uh, video. Uh, the surgeon uh, should always be gentle with the dissection and handling of neural tissue in such cases. Uh, third case is a 21-year-old man with severe uh, left leg pain, which had uh, lasted for seven months. Uh, Preoperative MRI shows the ruptured disc at uh, L4-5. Uh, after UBE, discectomy ruptured disc was removed. Uh, the, this intraoperative uh, endoscopic video shows ruptured disc uh, compressed uh, uh, left L5 nerve root. Uh, fourth case, a uh, 29-year-old man uh, presented with severe pain in both legs with claudication. Preoperative MRI images show the severe spinal stenosis with herniated lumbar disc at uh, L4, L5 level. Uh, after UBE surgery, central uh, canal is fully decompressed. A postoperative MRI was taken one day after the operation, uh, showing the sufficient uh, decompression of spinal canal and adequate uh, resection of lumbar uh, herniated disc. Uh, here, this is the UB stenosis surgery. Uh, let's uh, watch my uh, last video about how to perform UBE. Uh, you can see that the surgical view is much clearer during the operation. You can see all the steps, operative steps.
Uh, let's summarize briefly uh, what uh, we look at. Uh, UBE technique uh, gives a better and easier visu uh, visualization of all directions. The anatomic view uh, in UBE surgery is very similar uh, to that in conventional uh, open surgery and all, uh, allows a good visualization. UBE may be uh, an uh, alternative and min minimal invasive procedure for treatment of all degenerative lumbar disease. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Manko from uh, Turkey for this very interesting and illustrative talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> welcome. Uh, if we have uh, any uh, questions to uh, Professor Manko, uh, we have one question for you. Uh, do you put a drain and if yes, how long do you leave it? Uh, how much uh, do you uh, expect uh, as an uh, outflow on the regular procedure? Sorry? Uh, I, I repeat it. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I, I uh, saw a message. Do you put a drain and uh, if? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I uh, put a drain uh, just uh, twenty four hours. Yeah. How much do you expect as an outflow on a regular procedure? Uh, how much do you expect? Uh, sorry, I couldn't understand well, actually, how much do you expect it? Okay. The, the uh, question is not clear. Yeah, yeah, actually, I don't understand well uh, yeah, what... It's uh, not clear. It's not clear. It's not a, a straightforward question. Yeah. Let's say 50 milliliter or uh, 20, uh, 250 milliliter. What do you expect on a regular basis? The bleeding. Uh, yeah, uh, bleeding. Uh, actually, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I uh, use uh, 30. Uh, Thousand mm, uh, milliliter uh, inflow. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor yeah. Manko from Turkey, for joining us tonight. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And now we will move to the next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Javier Oliveira from Mexico. Hey, hello. <laughs> Hello, Professor Shab. Hello, sir. Welcome. You are very welcome, sir. It's a great honor for us. Perfect. Let me share my talk. Please. Okay. Can you see my talk? My, yes, my sir. Screen? Yes, sir. Perfect. Well, before starting my 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 talk, I want to congratulate all the uh, presenters. Uh, it's a very highly level discussion and course about spine surgery. And thank you very much for the invitation, Professor El Shaf, Dr. Baru, and the Egyptian Orthopedics Association and Bena Faculty of Medicine. Uh, I'm Dr. Javier Quillo from Mexico. I'm a spinal neurosurgeon. And today, even I love the biportal endoscopic spine surgery today, I will share with you my thoughts about uh, uniportal endoscopic decompression and the potential of this surgery for degenerative pathology from lumbar to cervical spine. Okay, let's let's start. Uh, you know there are so many uh, publications right now in the scientific literature, and this academic job has demonstrated that endoscopy has changed. The endoscopy has evolved. So maybe before uh, 20 years, uh, we can reach only uh, just uh, uh, this herniation in the lumbar spine and soft this herniation. 
But the technology evolved, the skills also evolved, and endoscopic spinal surgery right now is a part of the armamentarium for the spinal surgeon. We don't know if we call uh, specifically a endoscopic spinal surgeon. No, we are spinal surgeons, but we, we can take into account of these techniques and use to resolve highly specific pathologies. For example, degenerative uh, compression of the lumbar, thoracic, and cervical spine. So in the past years, so many authors have uh, proved that endoscopic spinal surgery has a place in the spinal surgery. So for example, uh, Christoph Hofstetter is a very good friend and also very good surgeon, skill surgeon. Comparing Recording in progress. In a retrospective uh, uh, study, he demonstrated that advantages, specifically in complications, in terms of comparative endoscopic ULBD against uh, minimal invasive tubular ULBD. And the group of uh, Christoph Hofstetter demonstrated that endoscopic ULBD uh, patient has uh, lesser uh, complications compared with minimal invasive tubular decompression, specifically in that group, in the, la the later group, they uh, found that durotomy is transient acute urinary retention and paresthesia were found in, in, in tubular decompression compared with endo-ULBD, only paresthesia, and one patient uh, underwent again to uh, another surgery. Also, we have uh, scientific literature about uh, biologi biological markers. For example, in patients underwent endoscopic endoscopical techniques, for example, uniportal or bipolar, uh, they, they, these um, scientific uh, works demonstrated that biological markers like uh, CPK or CRP uh, decrease over the time and the increase of these biological markers are lesser compared with uh, tubular or open techniques. But uh, Jeffrey Wang recently published a systematic, uh, systematic review. Uh, they documented that the outcomes reported in different studies demonstrate no inferiority of water-based endoscopy for degenerative spinal pathology compared with conventional or other missed techniques. So we can obtain the similar results at least with lesser invasiveness compared with open techniques using these approaches, endoscopical approaches. However, there are a negative point for uh, uh, several surgeons. For example, we need a steeper learning curve and special training to obtain specific skills in these techniques, in endoscopic techniques. Um, but right now, more and novel endoscopic procedures are being reported in the literature to approach other spinal pathologies differently than degenerative only. And I love this picture. This is a picture from a case that I had. Uh, this picture demonstrates one of the most important advantages regarding endoscopic spinal surgery, visualization. You can obtain direct visualization of the pathology or the anatomical landmarks. In this case, I put the endoscope in the base of the spinal process and I, I uh, help with the angulation of lens. I catch up of all the uh, neural elements decompressed in one patient that required that. I decompress L5 from the left and right side and then decompress uh, S1 in the left and the uh, right side and the central spinal canal. But the most important thing is the invasiveness. For example, in this case, we do not destroy or damage the facet joints. We undercutting the bone, we make another house, another home for, for the, the neural elements. This is the difference between other techniques. We can obtain direct visualization and we can uh, remodel or undercutting the bone and create newer spaces. Another important thing that is worried for other surgeons, for example, is the muscle damage. This is a very clear example about the muscle damage. One side of the image, imaging demonstrate in both, in both imaging, we perform a central decompression, but we don't know with, with which technique 
I used for this decompression. And you can, you can observe that the muscles are very similar, but we don't know if I do uh, interlaminar or tubular decompression, but this is the, real, the reality. In the left side, I perform a tubular decompression, and in the left side, I perform a endoscopic ULBD. But the muscle damage is very similar between both images. Another important thing is, for example, to know specifically the anatomy, the anatomy of the region that we gonna approach. Why? Because this is the imaging that we can observe with the endoscope. You know, if you want to approach uh, through posterior approaches the lumbar spine via interlaminar, we know that the most caudal levels has an increased size of the interlaminar space. So this is very important because uh, there is not only one approach to reach the, or catch up the pathology in the interlaminar space. We have very different approaches depending on the location of the pathology. For example, if we can reach the superior part or the, of the foraminal area or the subarticular zone, we can approach contralaterally over the top uh, respecting the ligamentum flavum and then crossing the midline to a keyhole. This procedure was published by Professor Park in, from South Korea uh, several years ago. And you can perform a keyhole just drilling, remodeling this, the base of the spinal process, the spinal process, and then cross the midline and reach the contralateral side. If the pathology is caudal, is in the subarticular area, or in the foraminal area, you can approach directly via interlaminar or contralateral interlaminar approach without touching the base of the spinous process. If you, if you have a, a pathology lo lo located in the axillary area or the shoulder area in the ventral epidural space, you can approach ipsilaterally. Or if you have a stenosis in the subarticular area, you have to recognize the landmarks, for example, the inferior articular process like, in, 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 like in, here in the image or the superior articular process and the interlaminar space. So the, the point is that the endoscopy is a highly specific and addressed surgery. Not all the approaches are useful for everything and not all the vias or the roots are useful for everything. So that, that is controversial among the different professors or experts in endoscopy. Right now, the AU spine uh, forms a task force to define or call the procedures. So there are decompression procedures via transforaminal, interlaminar, or posterior in the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar spine. So what is the, the first question, for example, in different courses that I have, uh, I have had to different doctors. The question is, what is the best way to approach the lumbar subarticular area? It depends because we have a transforaminal approach. And the, 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 the answer to this question is very simple. Transforaminal approach is the lesser invasive uh, way to decompress the foraminal area and the subarticular area. This is the real reality. However, if you have no obstacles to overcome, for example, a high iliac crest, or you have a suitable foramen or foraminal pathology, mix it with lateral recess pathology, you can uh, remove or you can approach two different birds through the same shot. Uh, ventral epidural pathology, for example, calcified disc, posterior or marginal bone spurs from the disc space, uh, hypertrophy of this uh, superarticular process, unilateral radicular symptoms, no central symptoms, for example, patients with neurogenic claudication, or uh, you, have, you can have cases with degenerative deformity with uh, specifically radicular symptoms and very highly specific one uh, radicular uh, symptom, you can go for with the transforaminal approach why? Because this approach preserves the most of possible the facet joint. This is an example of a patient with a severe subarticular and foraminal stenosis by degenerative reasons. 
First, you can observe it in the video. Uh, we approach the foraminal area and then we start decompression the excited nerve. Here is the excited nerve. And then after decompress the excited nerve, we have a space in the cambium area and we can remove the spurs in the ventral epidural space. After that, we have more mobilization or more free uh, movements with the working cannula and we can address the cannula to decompress precisely the traversing nerve. After that, you can observe the increasing area of the foramen, or of the foramen it, at L5 S1 and the patient resolved the symptoms. Uh, another important thing that is controversial is subarticular decompression via interlaminar, direct or contralateral. If we have a transforaminal approach, why we need to do interlaminar endoscopy? Because not everything is for all. For example, my recommendation, dorsal epidural pathology, for example, lumbar spinal central stenosis with neurogenic claudication, multiple nerve roots leading symptoms or bilateral symptoms, it's better to approach it by interlaminar uh, techniques. So for example, if we have a SIP uh, oblique with uh, risk of instability, maybe we can approach by interlaminar and not by transforaminal. Depends on pathology, but the goal is preserve as much as possible the contralateral stabilized structures. So if you have a dorsal pathology, it's prefer to approach by interlaminar endoscopy. Do the contralateral subarticular decompression via interlaminar endoscopy is useful? Yes, very highly specific approach for very localized pathology, dorsomedial to the facet joint. In the dorsal epidural space, you can work uh, very good with the interlaminar or posterior endoscopic approaches. Uh, not only uh, basic anatomical concepts or a scientific background is enough to perform good endoscopy. You need skills and you need technology uh, with wherever brand, but you need technology. So we have a special endoscope, endoscopes to, or, or lens to approach via interlaminar. And we have different obturators, different working sheds, uh, different types of carison, I'm sorry, different types of carison, different types of bores, and different uh, surgical tools to remove, retract, or dissect. The patient position is in prone as uh, another posterior and those uh, posterior approaches. Uh, the anesthesia depends of the skills of the surgeon. If the surgeon is a very highly uh, experienced doctor and the surgical time is shorter uh, or the learning curve is advanced, maybe conscious sedation is enough. But if you are not in that point, you can try with epidural or general anesthesia. In even some other doctors use uh, neuro monitoring during the surgery, and it's correct. Everything is correct if the patient is safe during the surgery. Uh, the intraoperative CR planning, it's very important. You know in your mind the anatomical concepts. Then you observe these landmarks in the imaging in a true AP view. And then you recognize the very, very clear, the interlaminar space, and then you address your approach. And the things that are in your mind, you need to see through the endoscope in the surgical procedure. After that, obviously the technique is developed and you can do a eight to 10 millimeters uh, skin, and then cut the fascia with the knife and delayed with the obturator and use the use always your dilator as your finger. You need to palpate the bone landmarks and feel the sensation to keep in mind that you are in a safe zone. And then you can introduce your working cannula through your obturator to starting the procedure. Finally, you starting the procedure, the endoscopic procedure, coagulating first the uh, tissue overlying of the uh, lamina, then you remove 
circumferentially the bone. You undercutting the bone in a circumferential way. First, the superior lamina to reach the attachment of the cranial and caudal uh, of the ligamentum flavum. Then you perform the contralateral decompression and in a very similar way that you uh, perform the decompression through the tube over the top, respecting always the flavum because the flavum is a barrier that protects the neural elements. And then when you perform in the bone decompression, you can remove the flavum. And the flavum, my advice is when you, you cannot remove in block the flavum, uh, take out piece by piece. There is no problem. So maybe you have, you need more time, but the, the, the most important thing is safe for the neural elements. This picture demonstrates that we are starting the procedure, the uniportal decompression posterior procedure via interlaminar ipsilaterally, and then we cross the midline and perform the contralateral decompression. This is a uh, case example of a 72 year old male with a severe central uh, spinal stenosis with claudication and very severe left radicular pain. And you can observe in the preoperative, in the superior panel, you can observe in the preoperative images, uh, a pathology in the ventral epidural space, not only the hypertrophy of the ligamentum flavum, hypertrophy of the facet joints, you can observe this finding. And look at the posterior, the postoperative immediately MRI, uh, a very good decompression was achieved. Here in the video, you can, you can observe that we reach the ventral pictorial pathology without retraction of the nerves. After a good decompression and central and lateral decompression with the endoscope, uh, we reach the, pathology, the ventral pictorial pathology. Finally, the neural elements are decompressed. This is another example of a 64 year old female with a radicular pain radiated down to the right leg. Uh, the patient had a flavum cyst. The cyst uh, was compressed the uh, subarticular area and we perform a interlaminar ULBD. Finally, we decompress the central canal and the subarticular area. But some surgeons can say, oh my God, what do you do with the facet joints in this patient? No problem because this is one of the advantages of the endoscopy. You can measure how many bone removal you do during the surgery. And this is the uh, CT scan of the same patient. You can observe how we preserve the facet joints. We perform a very big decompression, uh, the traversing nerve and the exiting nerves and we decompress and remove the, uh, the flavum cyst, but, but we respect the facet joints. This is another example in a 58-year-old female with uh, left-sided symptoms radiated down to the leg. Uh, the patient had intense paresthesias in the L5 dermatome. Uh, in the preoperative MRI, you can uh, figure out the severe uh, subarticular stenosis in the left side, compressing the L5 nerve root and compressing the S1 in the part. But we perform in this case a contralateral sublaminar approach, a CKS or contralateral keyhole interlaminar decompression. This is the intraoperative video. So you can observe here the base of the spinous process we clean the soft tissue and then perform a keyhole exactly in the base of the spinal process because this is the door that led us to cross the midline and then we can reach the contralateral side and only detach the flavum and complete the bone decompression in the contralateral subarticular area without touching or damaging the ipsilateral flavum or other stabilizing 
uh, elements of the spine. Then you can see in the video, finally, the L5 nerve uh, decompress it. What about the cervical spine? We know that uh, severe spondylosis can result in myelopathy, myeloradiculopathy, and all the, uh, all the experts has uh, documented that decompression is needed. And for example, we published a paper also about the technique of decompression of the cervical spine, but the landmarks are very similar to an open or tubular uh, decompression. You can figure out the P point, the junction of the superior articular process and the inferior articular process, the ascendant part of the uh, inferior articular process. Uh, here are the, the pedicles. And after see that, you can start your procedure to decompress central or just foraminal area in the cervical spine. The position of the patient is in trend Lemburg, and then you can do the skin incision and introduce your dilator uh, to only delay the muscles, not detach the muscles, not damage the multifidus or the uh, extensor of uh, muscles. Then, this is a, a, my advice to you. If you do these procedures, avoid uh, key wires because when you, don't, when you don't have skills or you are starting your learning curve or experience, maybe the needle can damage the ligamentum flavum and pass through the ligamentum flavum and um, percute the tecal sac. And this is catastrophic. The surgery finalized uh, even before starting. So after that, you can use only your dilator to feel the bone and then starting your procedure. This is a case example of uh, decompression of the cervical spine in a patient of 80 years old with quadriparesis, severe quadriparesis. You can observe uh, calcification of the ligamentum flavum in C4, C5, uh, very severe uh, uh, foraminal stenosis in the right side. And after the procedure, you can observe how we respect the contralateral lamina, but we decompress the central uh, canal. This is the pre-op versus post-op immediately uh, post-op MRI in the sagittal view. You can observe in C4, C5, the uh, hypertrophy and calcification of the ligamentum flavum, uh, high signal in T2 of the MRI. Uh, they are findings uh, that con are congruent with myelopathy. And finally, we decompress and the spinal cord is decompressed. Uh, this is the axial view of the MRI of the same patient. This is C4, C5 preoperatively, and this is C4, C5 postoperatively. This is C5, C6, the central spinal canal uh, compressed, and then we create a space for the spinal cord. And this is the intraoperative video of uh, uh, C4, C5 of the same patient, of the same patient uh, decompressed after bone removal of the superior lamina and inferior lamina, we detach the ligamentum flavum and we can observe the, the tecal sac and the spinal cord. In this case, we can uh, reach uh, in block, reach out in block the, the uh, ligamentum flavum. And finally, we perform enough hemostitia and very gentle and soft manipulation of the bone elements and ligamentum flavum elements to avoid damage in the spinal cord. Similar principles of open surgery are followed in these procedures. This is another case, it's a foraminotomy case in a patient of 53 year old male with a, a foraminal stenosis in C5, C6. And this is the intraoperative video. Again, we recognize the B point. This is the starting landmark and we are starting from this landmark. This is the cranial aspect of the surgical field. And with gentle movements with the carison, remove part of the facet joint, the medial part, not more than the 50%, similar than in tubular or open or uh, mini open procedure. 
Finally, you can observe both levels decompressed in the foraminal area without touching all the facet joint and respecting, respected all the stabilizing structures. But not always in endoscopy is good. We have complications as Professor uh, Sigden mentioned in, in, in her talk. We have complication in uniportal endoscopy this rate, this rate from 2.7% to 10.3%. So we have complication and this complication maybe are nerve root damage because manipulation, dural tear, if you remove uh, not gently the ligamentum flavum, for example, in patients with uh, degenerative stenosis in cervical lumbar spine with tight uh, additions between ligamentum flavum and dorsal epidural space and the tecal sac, uh, you need to dissect first the ligamentum flavum and then resect. Uh, epidural hematoma, if we don't, per we, uh, don't perform uh, very good hemostasia or insufficient decompression, if, you, if the surgeon is not familiar with the first cases with the technique, you can imagine that decompression is enough, but it's not true. Some cases of infection, for example, if you, if you damage the, the muscle, if you can edema of, in the muscles, or maybe you finalize converting the surgery because bleeding or other things. Obviously, incidental durotomy is a big problem, but thanks God, we have a low rate of uh, durotomies and we have several options to treat depending the size, depending if you damage the arachnoid layer, you need to convert the surgery because the most important thing as always is the safeness of the patient. But for example, in this case, we had a dural tear, a dural tear during the, the, the surgery. And here in the shoulder of the root, we put only a dural sealant and that's all because First, we never damage the arachnoid layer. Second, the, the dural tear, the defect caused by the technique is very small. And other thing is the dead space created by, by your tubular, by your endoscopic approach is too small. So the muscle uh, stop the leakage, leakage. So thank you very much for your invitation. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. And thank you, Dr. L. Schaub and Vlad Plinsky for the invitation. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Olvera from uh, Mexico. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, sir. Uh, I, I, I don't see questions in the uh, Q&A box. So we will move to the uh, last speaker, our dear professor, Professor uh, Alfonso Garcia from Mexico. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, sir. Thank you so much for having me. It's Thank a so pleasure to be here. Thank you to the uh, committee, organizing committee, and just happy to be here. I know I'm the last and it's late in some areas of the world, so I will start uh, immediately. Let me cancel this and tell me if the uh, uh, screen is okay. Yes, sir. So I, I will, uh, Javier Quillo made most of the work easy for me, so I will sum up and concentrate on just uh, two variants of one initial posterior approach uh, to the cervical uh, uh, segment. So it's uh, with the use of a single working channel, and I'm going to go uh, step by step in describing two techniques. So uh, the, the, the events that happened before we would be able to perform endoscopic surgery as we do it right now started in the late 40s with uh, Dr. Mixter. And as you can see, all of the procedures uh, developed uh, uh, from, from that date on uh, what were uh, actually uh, the, the main objective was to be less and less invasive. So from posterior cervical approach for a herniated disc, it developed in the late 80s to a keyhole lamin uh, laminoforaminotomy. And then in the early 90s, endoscopic surgery was developed, but not for cervical uh, approaches uh, initially. 
So it was until 2008 that Dr. Rutten in Germany uh, developed the first uh, full endoscopic cervical foraminotomy. <clears throat> From there on, uh, the, uh, the latest uh, case series that we have uh, published is uh, from Dr. Nishimura, 2017, with a case series of 11 cases. Dr. Jian Shen, a close friend of ours, uh, also with 18 cases uh, from 2016 to 2018. Dr. Carr, also with Dr. Hofstetter, a very close friend of ours, also K uh, 10 case series of bilateral decompression. So tonight we are going to uh, review very briefly the uh, posterior endoscopic cervical disectomy and the cervical endoscopic uh, ULBD, which stands for bilateral uh, decompression. Some of the uh, personal recommendation is that be very clear that these are advanced techniques in endoscopic spine, spine surgery. And I have found out that uh, through the years that the single most important uh, issue in uh, performing uh, a very safe endoscopic spine surgery is be familiar with the instruments. Instrument handling is key. It's a key concept you have to dominate before you can develop further into being a, an excellent endoscopic surgeon. So basic training uh, uh, after having very good experience with conventional and MIS posterior cervical approach is mandatory. Also be familiarized with lumbar endoscopic interlaminar approach. The difference between the interlaminar approach and the transforaminal approach is that in the transforaminal approach, the scope almost stabilizes by itself. You can let go the scope and the scope will stand on its own. And on interlaminar approach, the scope is very unstable. So your hands have to be very steady even in the lumbar spine, but in the cervical spine, you have to be more careful than in the lumbar spine. So be familiar with the interlaminar uh, approach, be familiar with all the drill bits you have available in order to perform a safe uh, procedure. So what are uh, some of the anatomical considerations that we have to take into account? Definitely uh, cervical spine uh, <clears throat> has unique uh, a structure, a bony structure. So the uh, the laminas actually prolong into the uh, into the facet joint, and they are superimposed on one another. So we have to remove bone in order to get to the neural structures and verify that we are doing a complete uh, decompression. So this is a, a reconstruction, an anatomical reconstruction of making the bone a little bit transparent, and we we can see how the nerve root actually passes beneath those uh, uh, two uh, thick bony structures which uh, stand for the uh, facet joints of the cervical spine. One study that I found uh, that explains uh, what to uh, take into account in, in the surgical planning of a posterior lamina for aminotomy was very recently published. So it defines a new uh, uh, a term, which is the uh, surgical critical width. And uh, the surgical critical width is uh, the starting point of the V, the V point that is identified uh, during the uh, surgery. So a positive uh, surgical critical width is when the uh, V point stands lateral to the lateral dura. And uh, negative it is when the V point stands medial to the most lateral border of the uh, dura. And this is very important because there are uh, reported variations in patients younger than 50 years old and patients older than 70 years old. And as we know, most of the um, myelopathic patients are over 60 years old. So we need to have uh, these numbers into account because below the level of C5, C6, the uh, dura actually is a little bit wider wider than in the patient uh, 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 younger than 50 years old. So that means that we will might have to take a little bit more bone out lateral to the V point in the patient over 60 years old that it's closer to, to 70 years old. And this is what I mean. When you start drilling in a patient less than 50 years old, uh, drilling uh, using the V point as 
uh, a starting point, you almost always end up lateral to the uh, dura or lateral to the shoulder of the exiting uh, nerve root. But this doesn't happen in the patient over uh, 70 years old. As you can see with the blue uh, circle right here, uh, you can, you can uh, know that the V point is medial to that lateral border of the dura. So that means you have to prepare in advance to take a little bit more bone out of that uh, decompression. So be familiar with the instrument you are going to use. There are many instruments and many name brands to use, but be aware that uh, each have their own uh, characteristics, their own dimension. So be familiar with the outer diameter, be familiar with the working channel diameter, be familiar with the optic angle, which is very important in uh, the view you are going to get once you start performing the surgery, and your uh, total length of endoscopic instrument. <clears throat> so just for cervical, a, a posterior cervical approach, in, in this company, we have at least uh, three options. We have the delta, which has an outer diameter of 10 millimeters. We have two types of elises. One that it's called the Elysis Pro, which I think personally is the most versatile uh, endoscope available with the widest uh, working channel ratio towards the, the, the total width of the, uh, of the scope. It's a very slim endoscope, only 7.3 millimeters in width, but a very wide working channel. So this makes it easier for the surgeon to take out more tissue. And the very recently developed uh, cervical dorsal uh, endoscope. It's a very short maneuverable uh, scope <clears throat> with exactly the same width dimensions of the Elysis Pro and the same uh, width of working channel, also with the same 15 degrees angle for scope. So you almost are looking directly downward with the scope. So uh, the OR arrangement, as I like to uh, do my surgeries, is I always keep my endoscopic tower to my right. It doesn't matter if I'm approaching from the left, if I'm approaching from the right, I always keep my endoscopic tower towards the right. My, uh, my fluoro monitors are always to my left and the C-arm, it's exactly at the level where I'm working. So for step one, <clears throat> patient position is prone. I like to ask the patient to prepare uh, the, the surgical area, the surgical site, at his home, he should shave and have helped uh, have help with that uh, activity. So on the day of surgery, there's no problem. And this is how we fix uh, our patients in prone position. And there are two ways of identifying the uh, the level. This is uh, this first option. I find it a little bit complicated, which is the intersection between two lines: is the, the most anterior and upper margin of the uh, upper level where it intersects with the line that unites the uh, disc level at the, the disc level we are working. And you see that pink line is exactly where we intersect. And that's where my initial uh, 18 gauge needle is placed. But another uh, very easy way to do it is just put it in the interlaminar space. And why do I say this so easy? It's because once you have incised both Aphasia, and you are following the uh, muscle uh, in, in insertion direction, the, the, uh, the, the, this, the instability of placing your scope once you dilate soft tissue actually permits you to slide even one level down and one level up. So through a single incision, you can even perform three-level decompression through the same skin incision. This is how uh, variable uh, the, the, uh, the, your initial approach uh, can be. So you don't have to be that precise when landing into the inters interspinous uh, uh, space because you have a lot of room for maneuverability of your scope once you're in. And I will demonstrate in a case at last. So you uh, confirmate. Uh, your needle placement on both planes. You don't have to stick the needle all the way in. You can do it, but you don't have to. 
And uh, you have to decide if you're going to do a transverse or longitudinal incision. I prefer doing a transverse because it's more aesthetic and it gives you room to uh, move the scope uh, from uh, same, same side to contralateral side. And uh, I am very aware that the uh, both of the uh, 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 superficial and deep posterior cervical fascia are very thick. So you do have to use a knife to incise both of them. And once I incise the, the deeper uh, fascia, I use a Kelly hemostat to uh, separate the muscle fibers following their direction, as, I, uh, as you can see in these uh, anatomical uh, models. So I follow <clears throat> the direction of the muscle fibers in order to separate and not to cut through the muscle. And I'm aware of the insertion of the uh, semispinalis and the multifidus, which uh, these muscles were, will divide and will make uh, a very good space to identify the bony structures for landing our uh, endoscope. So this is uh, followed by sequential dilation uh, and placing of the tubular retractor with the endoscope. So as you can see, uh, the first step is to, uh, I mean, the step six, obviously, but the first step once you put this scope in is to identify the V point. And uh, this uh, will look something like this. And the cannula itself, as Dr. Kiyo mentioned earlier, it can let you uh, have a good uh, measurement of how much bone you are taking out. And uh, uh, a variant of doing the uh, laminoforaminotomy on same side is that possibility to extend to the contralateral side through the same incision by just extending the approach to the contralateral side. So step eight is identify the nerve root and the pedicle and uh, as such. And um, next is mobilize the nerve root and perform a fragmentectomy as needed or resection of an osteophyte as needed depending on the uh, pathology. You can extend the approach further and uh, by just keeping medial to the, uh, to the pedicle, you can even resect a portion of the pedicle to augment your, your approach if, uh, if there's a much stenosis and, and you need to, to remove some osteophytes. Just remember to keep medial to the uh, pedicle to avoid the uh, vertebral artery. So this is uh, uh, an end, end picture. Uh, that documents the end point of the surgery where we see the uh, nerve root upper right. We see the, uh, the uh, C6 level, the pedicle of C7, and you see lateral at uh, bottom of that uh, picture. So I have two case examples to, uh, uh, to further uh, demonstrate what I have just uh, mentioned. So this is a pre-op MRI of C6, C7 right side uh, herniated disc. And uh, we performed uh, a same side uh, laminoforaminotomy. So the intra-op uh, fluoroscopy looks like this. Once the uh, cannula and the scope are both docked in. So I use the RF to further dissect and identify the bony structures. There we see to our right, uh, the lower uh, uh, rim of C6. So I just uh, resect the most posterior cortical, and I like leaving a very thin uh, anterior portion of that cortical to remove it carefully with my kerosene rangeur. Uh, now we have uh, some very uh, safe uh, drill bits that have a protective, uh, uh, a protective cover that uh, actually you can shave uh, the bone out of the lamina and perform a sublaminotomy very safely without violating either the, uh, the dura or uh, the uh, ligamentum flam that is uh, before the dura, obviously. So I'm working at uh, upper uh, margin of C7. And as you can see, the, uh, the shallow insertion of the uh, ligamentum flavum almost detaches on its own very easily. So you have to be very careful not to push too much, uh, use too much force on the kerosene and uh, take uh, your time in, in taking bite by bite. And I'm grabbing the, uh, the disc. 
out of the uh, axilla. And I'm checking for uh, more fragments there. And I take a documentation picture. I know not uh, always use a, a, a robotic arm, mechanical arm to stabilize my scope. This is, was one of my first cases. So I did use one for stability, but now I, I, I don't use it. So there you see the nerve root, the pedicle, cephalat, caudal, and lateral, and the nerve root fully decompressed. And that's the disc fragment and the uh, post-op with a, a small drain and the completely uh, removed uh, herniated disc. Uh, patient uh, four hours after the surgery was moving freely in her uh, hospital room. Uh, almost no blood loss. It took me a little bit of a while. As I said, it was one of my first cases. So next case is um, uh, cervical uh, myelopathy. So I did a two level decompression with a bilateral decompression. This patient also had uh, OPLL and uh, he uh, developed rapidly uh, uh, very uh, severe and, and, and low score JOA after eight months, he was walking and, and at eight months, he went from walking to a wheelchair and he was unable to move his arms. You see uh, two, two levels of compression right there. So this was uh, to help in my planning. So first uh, identified the V point at C3, C4. And you start off exactly the same as if you were going to do a single site for aminotomy, lamina for aminotomy. And I initially extended, you see the midline right there, you see the, 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 the ligamentum flammum uh, going a little bit folded upward in the midline. So I actually extended my dissection already to the contralateral side to facilitate my uh, lamina for aminotomy while performing it. So this, uh, helps me uh, perform the uh, decompression faster. So you leave the uh, ligament of flammum attached as much as possible. I'm working underneath uh, C3, same side. Going to a uh, contralateral side, same side uh, lamino uh, laminotomy, contralateral side laminotomy with a uh, flavum intact. It's a very, very good uh, uh, natural uh, protection you should keep on. And while you do the, uh, the, the, the caudal decompression, the, uh, the flavon ends up detaching on its own. So you just have to fish it out and remove what's remnant. So in this single step, I was lucky enough to remove it almost end block. And now you can document a fully decompressed C3, C4 level on both sides, ipsilateral and contralateral side, fully decompressed. Now I'm sliding, I'm not removing the scope, I'm just sliding on top of C4 and landing on C4, C5, V point, same steps, dissection early, try to go to the contralateral side, I'm using the dissector right there. I'm not detaching the muscle, I'm just elevating. And I'm starting at the uh, lower level of C4, exactly the same steps, lamina for aminotomy on one side, and then extend your approach to the contralateral side. In this side, I wasn't that lucky in to remove the, uh, the flavum end block, but uh, it wasn't hard to remove the contralateral side, a little piece of bone there from the upper uh, edge of C5. And now fully decompress on both sides, a little bit of uh, flavum remnant on the other side, but it was enough. So document endpoint, C4-5, C4 lamina, and C3-4 to the left. And this is the single incision less than a centimeter in width, in transverse, and almost a band-aid taken home. Uh, both sides and uh, two-level decompression on bilateral took me three hours. 
a patient uh, three months after surgery was moving his arms and was eating on its on his own. So very rapid uh, result, good result. So I still don't have that much cases. Humbly, I compared my three cases to the rest of the uh, cases published and have very similar uh, results. The uh, surgical time uh, varies between 93 minutes to 72 minutes for a single side, um, a mean of 81 uh, minutes per uh, level. So uh, intra-hospital days vary from 5.7 days in, in some series from Nishimura to uh, less than one day from Dr. Shen. So a mean of two days, almost no bleeding, uh, most of the patient actually recover from uh, an early joa between 10.7 to 5 points at the end of the, uh, the follow-up. So take-home message. Uh, uh, endoscopic techniques are very uh, new, but the, uh, the objective of performing a posterior decompression is not new. We are following exactly the same objectives. We are just using a different tool and a different viewing system. We need more publications. The technique is still improving, but it is a very promising technique because series actually prove that there are very few complications, minimal tissue disruption, and short hospital stay. Thank you very much. Again, this is uh, my contact details. You can email me and check out my webpage, and I would be happy to keep in close contact with each and every one of you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Garcia, for uh, this illustrative talk and for making this unique uh, technique uh, very familiar and very easy for uh, every one of us to do it. Recording Thank you so stuff. much, sir. Thank you. Uh, if we have any questions, uh, I, I don't see questions in the uh, Q&A. So finally, at the end of this very fruitful scientific night, from the bottom of my heart, uh, I would like to thank all our eminent speakers, national and international, wishing you all the best. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was a great pleasure and great honor for me. You are very welcome. Uh, I hope to see you again and again in uh, any future uh, scientific meetings. Thank you so much and hoping you all the best. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, thank you. Happy to participate. Thank you so much, sir. See you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wishing you all the best, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good night, sir. Thank you so much. Good night, professor. Thank you, so Thank you very much, everybody. Mm. Oh,